Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to the 2020 Houston Cinema Arts Festival. My name is Jessica Green and I am the artistic director of the festival. So you are in for a powerful, powerful treat tonight. Welcome to Rest in Peace DJ Screw, a virtual tribute and panel discussion. We have illustrious guests tonight, incredibly illustrious. We have with us Michelle Wheeler, DJ Screw's sister. We have Isaac Yeoman, the director of All Screwed Up, a visual tribute to DJ Screw. And we're gonna be showing some clips from All Screwed Up. Uh, throughout this panel discussion and program. We also have Miriam Heads, the producer of All Screwed Up. And last, but certainly not least, we have the one and only Bun B of UGK and Houston Cinema Arts Society and festival board member. So we're gonna get into it. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions and then we're gonna show some clips throughout the conversation. We're going to ask you to share your questions on the chat. So please start submitting your questions. I'm gonna be pulling questions from the chat throughout the hour for sure. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna get this started. So this is a question for all of our panelists. And I wanna start with Michelle um, first, you know, DJ Screw's sister. Um, you know, this is the 20th anniversary of, of uh, DJ Screw's untimely passing. And the question for all of you, you know, for Michelle as a sister, for Isaac and Miriam as storytellers, for Bun B as a collaborator, um, and again, starting with Michelle, why do we celebrate DJ Screw tonight? What is his legacy? What do you want people to know about Screw, the icon, and also the man as your brother? Michelle, let's start with you, please. Well, first of all, hello, and thank you for having me on here. Um, the first thing, you know, for Screw the Icon, um, I just I really just want everybody to know and understand that he was man person first before he became DJ Screw, before he became that iconic person, man that he is today. Um, Screw is is and was very humble. He wanted to make everything and everybody great. You know, it just, this wasn't for him. He was more about helping other people start their careers, pushing them, and in return, didn't know what he was going to get out of it. Didn't know that what, what he was doing to help other people was actually really just going to make him the person the man, the legend that he is today. Um, so that's that's the way I feel about the I iconic mm. side of it. Um, him as my brother, you know, I knew Robert Earl. You know, that that's what I knew Robert Earl um, before he became DJ Screw. And he still had that same little heart of gold. He had this dream years before um, we even thought that this would happen, you know, a bunch of things that he did at home. At that moment, my mother knew what he was going to be and what he was, mm. what he was, what he was going to do in life and what his goal was. Um, and she supported him in every way that she could and, you know, let him know that whatever he wanted to do, he was going to be great at it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, mm. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Um, <laughs> I, going on to Isaac and, and then Miriam, if y'all could share, you know, your thoughts as storytellers, as the creators, as uh, director Isaac and producer Miriam of All Screwed Up, which is phenomenal, by the way. Um, as storytellers, you know, could you share your thoughts about DJ Screw's legacy and, and what you want folks to think about tonight? Starting with Isaac. Um, you know, to be honest, I'm a fan first. You know, um, yeah, I'm a filmmaker, but ultimately, um, I'm a fan. You know, I started listening to Screw when I was a kid, um, and you know, I was just having a talk with some friends, and just like it's so embedded in our culture that you don't necessarily know when or where you even got this lingo 
or got this style or, you know, little phrases. Mm. It's so embedded in our culture. And to understand that it's all derived from, you know, one place Mm -hmm. that was rooted with one person that, you know, spread out to be um, such a, you know, huge thing. I mean, it's just, you know, screw is, 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 you know, just a, just an icon, like you said. And, and for me, as a storyteller, you know, I just wanted to show who Screw was outside of what people expected. You know what I mean? Um, it was important for me um, to go to Smithville and and beat off the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Michelle, man, this Smithville boy, I know I was in the country for real. I woke up to roosters. I was like, Lord, Michelle, where, where you got me, lady? <laughs> uh, um, but you know it was important for me to go to his you know like I went to his house where he grew up as a kid you know what I'm saying and just walking through that with Michelle and just feeling like his spirit in that space you know what I'm saying and like like man my room was here his room was here I remember him scratching and playing music and I'm knocking on the wall like mm. shut up shut up Earl <laughs> turn that music down you know what I mean and like so I guess it was just important for me to tell the story of Robert Roy Davis, and then, you know, slowly share a, a glimpse of who Screw was, um, the person that we as fans know. Um, and yeah, just to show his his, his trials and his triumphs, um, and, uh, you know, and try to just embody all that at, at the same time while being artistic, um, you know? And so, and we excited to share this visual tribute tonight. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a big thing for Texas, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, when you think about Texas, you, you know, a lot of people try to, um, I noticed the, the Houston Cinema Arts Festival with, with Screw and, and Bond and people that came in that, they created a culture for Texas. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like when you think about Lil Kiki's first album was Don't Mess With Texas. Mm-hmm. When you think about the Texas Relays in Austin, you know what I mean? When you think about the Capitol in Galveston, when you think about the, um, you know what I mean, the rodeo in Houston and people swinging and the car shows. And when you think about the the state fair in Dallas and people swinging and popping their trunk, like that was, like it was bigger than a person. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And so I think that piece of it is so, um, so crucial for people to understand is just bigger than just a person who was a whole subculture that was attached to this movement, to this time. And so, uh, yeah, man, we're just excited to share this with the world. And uh, thank you guys for having us. No, thank you. And again, I mean, what you and Miriam created is just phenomenal. And we're going to look at some of it. It's just incredible. Miriam. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, share with us. Like, yeah, why, what do you want folks to, on the 20th anniversary tonight, what do you want folks to you know, think about when they think about Screw and what are your thoughts as this incredible storyteller that has created this phenomenal piece? Thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Um, for me, you know, I grew up on the North side. I am not a South sider. So um, and if, if y'all don't know, like there's a distinction and Screw culture kind of started on the South side. So for me, it was, it was a learning experience. And I think I want people to to learn about DJ Zero, like from his inception as a kid and how he, mm. he developed his passion for music with his mother's records until the day that, you know, um, he developed his craft, like, and really um, perfected it, really. And and knowing what it, what it means to, like, walk in your purpose and walk in your truth as a creative and not being not being um, deterred by outside things and 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 you know because everybody that we spoke with about Scoop said that like he wasn't someone who who chased after clout he wasn't someone who was um, you know all about himself he really was just about his music his craft and putting everybody else around him on and that really I want people to see Scoop's heart through this film because his heart really is, you know, who he is as a, as a person. And I think we can learn a lot about, a lot from him um, in that way and really kind of 
take that on into our own lives. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I I would want people to to learn and to know about screw. Mm. Thank you, Miriam. Yep. Fun. Um, as a collaborator, what do you want folks to think about tonight on the 20th anniversary? What is DJ Screw's legacy? Could you speak on that a bit? Yeah, so you'd be very hard pressed to find an individual who means to this, who means more to this city than what Screw means to Houston. Mm. You know, when you think about the musical landscape and the identity of Houston, um, it's very hard to not have Screw as a part of that conversation. For many young people, particularly of color in this country, the first thing they think of when they think of Houston is DJ Screw, which is amazing considering that Houston is the home of people like Beyonce and Pimp C, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Who music fans have deep love and admiration for. But even those two people, uh, you know, Pimp C famously said, Robert, Robert Earl Davis is the king of the South. Mm -hmm. Anything else said, just shut your effing mouth, you know? <laughs> It was very important to us because Screw not only gives us musical motivation, but also life motivation, right? To have hustled his way and grinded his way to where he was from just a DJ selling mixtapes uh, on consignment and at clubs to being this worldwide musical icon. And it's important to lift him up and honor him in a very royal way because he was a king and he still is a king. And the beauty about Screw is that you get to see a self-made man in real time. Mm. Like what Screw created and gave yeah. to this world, no one had ever done before and no one can really do um, since. Uh, his contributions to not just music in Houston, but music worldwide spreads across genres. You know, there's Screw and interpretations of rap records of R&B records, of pop music records, of country Western mm -hmm. records, you know? It's all distinctly Texas and it's all distinctly Houston and it's all distinctly Screw. Mm. Um, when we look past the, the, the musical legend and icon that is Screw, when you think about the person, you'd be hard pressed to find someone as humble as Screw. Mm. To have the power that he had in this city and the command that he had over this city and to not misuse it is astonishing. No one person, again, no one person was more lifted up in the eyes of Houstonians than someone like Screw. But he never used his notoriety, his fame to belittle people, to make people feel small, to make people feel like outcasts. That was the, that was the beauty of Screw. Screw brought people together mm. in a very real way. And Screw gave people careers. Screw made people famous. He never asked for anything in return. Um, Screw put all these rappers from the SUC on the map. He never wanted to link tie people into record deals. He never wanted control over mm. people's lives or careers. Mm. He just wanted to put his boys on from the hood, mm. you know, which is extremely commendable because he could have been like a Suge Knight. He could have been a baby, <laughs> you know. He could have been the, he could have created the Rough Riders of Houston or the Rockefeller of Houston, but that's not what Screw wanted for his people. He didn't want his people to work for him. He oh. wanted his people to be bosses. He wanted everybody around him to come up and, and be self-made individuals like him. And, you know, oh. we, we should all be like Screw in that way, right? To just want to lift our fellow man up. So there's oh. professional things that we learn from Screw, but there's also these personal life lessons that we learn when we look at the life of DJ Screw. And for people like myself, um, who was blessed enough to know him, we are eternally grateful for him as a friend, uh, for a mentor of many young people, uh, for creating a platform that gave young black men uh, viable um, employment. Mm -hmm. People could take care of their families now for the rest of their lives because of being attached to DJ Screw, being a part of the Screwed Up Click. And, uh, it's, it's our duty to make sure that people never forget these things, that people know these things, and to make sure that his, his life and his legacy lives on. Mm. Thank you, Bon. All right, we're gonna, that was incredible, everything that everybody said, um, as I imagined it would be. Um, Michelle, can you, we're gonna look at the clip collectibles first.
Can you just, um, Isaac said you could share some, can you share some background on this clip as we, as we cue it up, lead into it um, from All Screwed Up and just mm -hmm. share your thoughts before we watch it? Thank you. <laughs> you know, it, it is real time. It is, you never know what you kind of put in the back of your mind until something is recreated. Okay. And watching all screwed up these clips, it just really put everything that we worked, that he worked so hard for um, in the house, you know, the house that this kind of really, I really started, you know, that was a house that Nikki and I had found and, mm. you know, where people were, you know, coming to buy their $10 tapes and, you know, to, to watch that form and didn't really know where anything was, you know, where it was really even going, you know, um, but to watch all screwed up, to watch every detail, every scene that Isaac put together was like a wow factor because it, it was an emotional factor it was an exciting factor. It was a joyful factor. It was, it was, it was every emotion that is out there wrapped up into one big mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. And so um, watching it and I, and I hope everybody feels the same way when they watch it as well, mm -hmm. you know, all of the emotions um, of every, every blood, tear, sweat that he poured over to everything so yes okay thank you michelle all right so we're going to queue up the clip collectibles and then we'll we'll talk after we watch it so let's let's queue that up collectibles Oh, so you a DJ now, huh? See, that's what's wrong with all this damn hip hop. Y'all don't know how to appreciate nothing. It, you gonna ruin my records. You know these are collectible? And they gonna be worth a lot of money one day. I'm gonna be worth a lot of money too. Yeah. <laughs> it's not with this rap. Okay, so we're gonna get back into it. Um, yeah, so um, Michelle, was there anything else that you wanted to share about All Screwed Up? Um, and I'm gonna take some, some audience questions, but I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to share now that people have seen the first clip. <laughs> You know, I just, I just, what I, what I really hope is that everybody out of this first clip, they get the concept of it um, as far as screw, as far as, as the legacy, as far as his life. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a couple more questions and folks, please uh, send questions to the chat. We definitely want your questions. We wanna add them to the discussion for sure. Um, so Isaac, this is a question from, for you um, and maybe for, for Miriam too. Um, like how did you, there's so many people, the screwed up click, there's so many people that are part of this history that are part of the story. Um, how did you choose your entry point, you know, with, that in mind, that there, there are so many people that are part of this and, you know, especially thinking of the screwed up click. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, process? Yeah. 
for sure. I mean, so uh, this is a visual tribute, so it's not a full-length feature film. Um, and we knew that Screw's life is just, it's just it's too much to put in any amount of time, honestly. But, uh, you know, you just can't tell everybody's story. Um, and so what we did before we even put the pen to the pad on the script is we had various conversations with various people that we knew were close to Screw. Um, just from the music side first, then the family, um, because I wanted to get an idea, a, a idea of cross-reference or a point of cross-reference. You know what I mean? Because, um, you know, so we, we kind of took notes of like from 94 to about 99. And then we knew at some point we have to kind of isolate in on a time. Um, and that was important because that's the only way that you can tell a full story. Cause I mean, I'm sure Screw probably had six, seven stories just in one year. You know what I mean? Um, and so the time period was kind of like our, our point of entry. Um, and the reason why we felt like that, that 94 to 96 era was so important was because this is the time when tapes really start going crazy. You know what I mean? Um, and again, we use the time reference. So for instance, we talked to Kiki first and kind of you know, me and Kiki are really close. We had a relationship in the music industry prior to this project. And then when we started talking, he was kind of telling me when he met Screw, um, when the tapes start kind of taking off, when the lines start kind of getting long. And then obviously I cross-referenced that with Nikki. And then I cross-referenced that with Michelle. And then when I start seeing like, okay, all of these kind of moments are starting up a line, okay. Michelle tells me her and Nikki found the, the screw house with the wood room around this time. And this is around the same time when Kiki is saying that it's kind of taking off. So, you know, we knew about the Quill, Med the Quill Med Meadows house before we knew about the Broadway apartments, but we had to isolate it on a time so that we could tell somewhat of a cohesive story. Um, and so, yeah, just we just kind of cross-referenced all of those things. And then another, another piece of the puzzle is, this is just a harsh reality of film. everybody got a story, you know what I mean? Um, and especially when it comes to Screw, everybody and their mama got a story. Um, and so, but the thing is, is that there's there's multiple levels to actually going from a idea to inception. So it took, it took like seven, eight months of just talking to people. Yeah, just talking. it's good. Just talking and walking and mm. listening, you know what I mean? And then mm. you you hear a piece of the story and like, okay, that's something. And then the next step is like, okay, that's piece of the story sticks with you. And then, okay, cool. Now let me put that piece of the story to the paper. Mm. And when you start writing out the script outline, it's like, okay, so the story sounded good just from talking. But then sometimes when you put it on paper, it may not sound good. Like when you're reading it, it just doesn't sound like a dope story. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so then that's that's one layer. But then after you even get the pen to the paper, then you have to actually get it on screen, which you need to get the actor to actually, you know, uh, perform what's on paper, what's on the script. Um, and so there's a lot of deleted scenes, you know what I mean? And so... There's so many elements to actually getting to what you actually see on screen. You got almost four steps. Like I said, you got the story. Then you take from what you hear in that story, one little piece. And then you put it on paper and kind of fictionize it because it has to look good mm -hmm. for camera. And then how does the actor actually make that sound good on paper if it even makes it to paper? And then once you actually film all of that and get in the space and get in the atmosphere of wherever, how does it actually look and feel? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of the process we kind of took. And, you know, we did that with, we just tried to kind of take pivotal moments that we felt like would be impactful. And how can we integrate that with the resources that we have, um, with the information that we have, 
and kind of make it work. And so mm-hmm. that's that was kind of our process um, mm-hmm. throughout the way. Yeah, I mean, it's. I just have to say, I think the through line is love. I mean, throughout the whole process, there is, what you put together is just, it, there's so much love in it. It's so bursting with love and the, the care, I mean, the way you, the production design and is insane. Yes. You know, and the performances are insane. There's just like so much love went into what you all did. Um, and speaking of All Screwed Up, let, this is a good time to just share with the audience. So what's going on with the project tonight? There is a special, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so tonight, opportunity, yeah. Yeah, so. It's 11 16, obviously, in honor of DJ Screw's 20 year memorial um, tonight at 11 16 p.m. Central Standard Time for everybody who pre ordered a screw box. Um, they'll get a chance to get the exclusive screening of the entire visual tribute. So we ain't holding nothing back. We ain't holding nothing in the, in the canister. We ain't got nothing, nothing left in the vault. Everything we got, we sharing. Because I know a lot of people like, well, when is this? And when, and everything we got, y'all gonna see tonight. So to all of the people that was uh, supportive and got a screw box, um, and we thank you because you know part of that, part of those proceeds keep screws legacy going, keep things in motion. Um, can you yeah, still get? Can you still get it? Can you still get a screw box? Pre-order, okay. Pre-orders are closed right now. Okay. Okay. But but we probably will um, open up something after the memorial. Um, all right. Nice. But, you know we still we still working through through the details on that with Michelle and Charles. Yeah. Man, we're, we're excited about um, sharing this tonight. And uh, man, we just, we put a lot of hard work into getting this, yeah. getting this done. And, and, and remember, we got, we, we have to put the final touches on through a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a whole nother hurdle that mm-hmm. I mean, we wasn't even expecting. We, um, and so to 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 just see what we did and what we how things turned out, man, I couldn't be more proud of of my team, Miriam Tan, all of the lead actors, Roche, Lachey Boom, uh, Kyle Mosley who played Baby Screw, mm. <laughs> uh, Carlene who played Michelle, mm. Phil Wade who played Screw's dad, Robert Earl Senior. Mm. There's just so much dope talent um, yeah. on this project. And uh, man, we were really excited. So yeah, tonight, 11, 16 p.m. Central Standard Time, allscrewedup.com. Nice. Yeah. So we're gonna, uh, we have a question from the chat. Michelle, I think this is for you. The question oh, is, no. did DJ Screw ever have a nine to five job? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the, I thought that was a good question. That's one of the questions from the chat. Did Screw ever have a nine to five job? I don't think he had a nine to five job, but he did have a job where he worked at Rice Grocery oh. um, as a night stalker. Um, so yes, he did. He he had some form of job experience <laughs> before he really just let loose with the tapes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Isaac, let's set up the next uh, clip registration. Can you just share a little bit about registration before we we watch that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this clip you guys are about to watch is uh, a scene where Screw is just, you know, being black in America in the 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's... Or not the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm, I'm, today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and, and so that and that was and that's why this that's why this project you know beyond being a fan as a filmmaker and as a storyteller you know when you strip all of the fanfare away what's the story you know what I'm saying um, and 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 what connected with me on so many different levels and uh, you know I salute Bon for standing and I, I told him this the other day we were just talking and having a conversation for another project and I was just like man I salute you for fighting a good fight because. And y'all been dealing with this since I was a child, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, to see somebody like Bun on the front lines fight for social equality, um, and just to see somebody like Screw, by all accounts, was the most not 
gangster, not thugging in the streets. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure there were some people around him that was about that life. But Screw, by all accounts, was not that guy. And so to see, you know, somebody with a very um, introverted personality and having to deal with fame, that's a that's a thing that you got to kind of work on a Libra scale. You know what I mean? Somebody who, like Michelle said, he don't really want the fame, but he got it now. And it's like, how do you balance that? You know what I'm saying? So this clip y'all about to see, um, cop pulls him over um, and he recognizes Screw. And uh, yeah, y'all kind of see what happens from them. Okay, let's queue up registration. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, beautiful day. Uh, I'm getting mine to stay out of the way. Yeah. Been on the grind, ain't no time for the play. Uh, behind the tent, I just hide from the rays. In the cloud of that haze, got my mind in the days. Uh, something solid you never could face. Uh, I'm on the path and they stuck in the maze. Yeah. That Frankie Beverly go with the maze. Had to set me your blaze. They don't see it how I see it, man. You boys too blind. Weeks pass and you're wasting your time. Uh, went and built my own shit, never falling in line. Me slack, now you out of your mind. Uh, when you look into yourself, be surprised what you find. Fuck them, I'm a worry. Candy Blue, huh? You from the north side? Registration. Man, you know I ain't did nothing. Come on, man. Registration. You don't want my license? Oh, I know who you are. You up there off Broadway. Now, I don't know what you got going in there, but I know it's illegal. Dog, you don't know what you're talking about. Come on, man. How could someone like you afford something like this? Be careful. You know they be jacking. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so we have another question. We have a, um, a question from the chat. Maybe it's a comment, Bun. I think this is for you. Uh, somebody on the chat is saying they're not from Houston. They're from out of town. And they, they want to get a better sense of what was going on at the time, the scene, this revolution, if you will, um, this moment that you were part of, that Screw was part of. Can you, you paint a picture what it was like you know, at that time when this was all exploding um, and just share a little bit for, for those on the chat that weren't around, weren't in Houston, maybe weren't alive. Uh, yeah, I, I could try to paint a picture for people. So it's not, the scene is not what it is today, right? Lean is not a popular drink. Um, you know, the, the idea of the slab in Houston for our generation is a fairly new thing. Slabs have been around since the 80s, right? Hence the 83 and 84 inch rims that people ride. Um, the 83s and the 84s, excuse me. But um, Houston is dealing with some internal friction between the north side and the south side. It's not as prevalent as it would eventually become. Um, and Musically as an identity, the only only thing we have here at the time is a few local independent groups and rap a lot records, right? And this is during a period where music is actually transitioning from cassette tapes to CDs and eventually it would, it would go towards digital music. And so Screw is one of those people who firmly believes in the cassette tape, right? Now at this time, there were mixtapes were very prevalent in society, but a lot of them were being done on CDs, right? And Screw 
uh, in his typical style is, you know, doing something, man, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm on this, you know what I'm saying? I'm on knees. And so the, the idea of the, of the screw tape really comes from the screw tape that we know now is an extension of the original concept of people just, um, you know, one ordering a mixtape from screw, um, some people paying extra to be able to do shout outs on the screw tapes. And eventually that turns into people freestyling on mixtapes. And so the fame that we see people like Kiki eventually come into uh, guys like Pat and Hawk, all of that comes from these first earliest mixtapes. <clears throat> and so the scene at the time is there are North side people who are eventually in this really just one neighborhood, um, you know, who are targeting people on the South side in their slabs. So it's a very contentious time. If you do choose to ride a slab at this time, you have to be prepared to protect it with your life because <clears throat> people are being targeted because of, it, because of it. And so you have guys who are freestyling on the tapes, actually speaking about what's happening on the South side at the time. Uh, because they, there is no actual screwed up click at this time, guys are really just rapping about what they're going around, what they're doing at that time and what's happening on the South side of Houston. Um, and lots of people don't have that internal view of what the South side is at the time, right? Um, who's riding where, the after hours and third ward, all that kind of stuff. People don't really know about that stuff unless you're from that hood. So it's really people painting a picture of what it's like on the South side of Houston. And that's really what the screw tape started out as just a pure representation of life on the South side of Houston. It eventually became a picture of life in Houston in general, because the spread of the music and the spread of the culture ended up in uh, an envelope in the whole city. And, you know, there really was no outlet for these independent artists at the time, right? So if you had dreams and aspirations of being a rapper on the South side, um, there was nowhere for you to go to kind of be heard and be represented. And that's where the screw tape comes in for, for many people. It's their opportunity to be seen and heard in the city. And it puts a lot of up and coming people on the map. You know, it, it's, the, it's the jump off point for, you know, again, little Kiki, people like the Botany Boys, uh, you know, eventually it'll become the jumping off point for people like Trey, people like Zero, Lil O, um, you know, and everyone kind of gets to speak their truth about what their viewpoint is uh, in terms of life on the South side of Houston. And it is still to this day, like the perfect way for people to get a sense of what to expect when they come here. Because a lot of people don't really have an idea of what life in Houston really is. Uh, in the same way that listening to like Tony Touch mixtapes or K-Slay or DJ Clue mixtapes would have given you an idea of what life was like in the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. You know, so Screw is, is actually not only a musician in this moment, not only a platform for people, but it's he's he's acquiring and telling the story of Houston at, in real time. You know, so Shrew is also actively a documentarian, mm. right? Because he's he's actually putting all of these stories of life in Houston at the time on, on cassette for people to hear, listen, and relate to. But he's also a historian, right? Because it paints a picture of what's happening in the city at that time. Mm -hmm. And we can actually go back and see Houston's growth uh, musically and culturally simply by listening to old screw tapes. You can learn exactly about what kind of cars people were driving, how they were dressing, um, where they went to aid, how they communed. All of these things are historical record now because we have these screw tape archives that we can go back and listen to. Mm. Mm. And what about the, the gray tape? Talk about it. Okay, so again, when we talk about screw using the gray tape in the age of CDs, it's really about sticking to his ways, right? Screw was very particular about his ways, right? He wasn't a very overbearing person. He wasn't a loud and a boisterous person. He basically had a routine and he stuck to that routine. So even when there were other ways for him to perhaps um, use these other mediums to get his music out there, really until he meets up with Russ 
uh, Russell Washington at Big Time Records is the first time Screw even entertains the notion of putting out his own record. Because Screw is very comfortable in his space, right? Screw never wanted to be the most notable person in the room. He didn't want to stick out like a sore thumb. Most people in Houston have only ever seen Screw's face through flyers and t-shirts. You know, the majority of people in Houston have never actually seen DJ Screw. All they know about Screw is the gray tape. Mm -hmm. You know, which is, I think, the beauty of this film is to go back and show, it basically humanizes Screw, right? Because Mm -hmm. people in, People around the world really, because again, Screw didn't shoot videos, right? Screw didn't do necessarily a bunch of shows. Screw wasn't the kind of DJ that's scratching and on the mic, what's going down? What's up, everybody? I'm DJ Screw, right? He wasn't he wasn't that kind of guy. He was a very laid back guy. He just wanted to sit in the back room and and DJ and play what records. DJ Khaled, right? It wasn't another yeah. one. No, 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 not at all. That wasn't even his personality yeah. or his character. He's actually the the full antithesis of what a yeah. DJ Khaled is. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying one is better than the other. No, that's sure. That's just the reality of yeah. who people are personality-wise. But I think the yeah. idea of the gray tape, the cassette, right? It really keeps us in that moment in time, right? And it, and it lets us know exactly the era in which we're talking about. Because there are young people in this world who probably have never played, have actually physically put a cassette tape in a radio and push play, right? But they have a frame of reference for what cassette tapes are and represent based off of DJ Screw and his legacy. That's why when we think of Screw, you don't think of Screw the man because he never put himself in front of the music, mm-hmm. right? And that's why we continue to identify him by the gray tape. Mm-hmm. Gray tape is Screw, right? Mm-hmm. But it's also Houston. Mm-hmm. Mm. And this might, this might be a question for you, Bun, but also maybe for Michelle. Um, this is from the chat as well. Like, and you touched on this before, Bun, but in the chat, somebody's asking about the commitment to hand-to-hand distribution that he held. Like you talked about before, not going into like starting a label, becoming part of a major label. I don't know, Michelle, if you want to touch on this too, the commitment to that way of doing things, selling the tapes directly hand-to-hand to folks um, you know, in the community. Yeah. That was, you know, for for Screw, that was his way of, you know, this is mine. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. nobody nobody did anything on this. You know, I created this, and I'm handing it to you. That's that's kind of where it, you know he never never really just thought of a, a distribution scale. You know, because he did everything himself. You know, I remember, you know, as I told Chill, I remember dubbing great tapes you know trying to get ready for the sale you know and it was it was his it was it was work Mm -hmm. and he wanted it he wanted to do the work not someone else Mm. so Mm -hmm. i yeah it it was more for him to for him to say as as the saying says if screw didn't do it it's not screw tape and that that Mm -hmm. it literally meant that if he didn't make the copy, if he didn't write on it, if he didn't hand it to you, he didn't do it. Mm. Yeah, And you know, there's this idea of of people taking pride in their work, Mm -hmm. right? And there's the ability to, for there was the ability for Screw to do what he was doing in a different way, but it wouldn't have, to him, meant the same. You know what I'm saying? There's a beauty in being able to create something with your hands and then hand that thing to someone, right? To actually physically give yeah. that thing to someone. It's not about stocking it at record stores or making it available online or whatever, but it's that personal touch. Like if you had a screw tape, right? It's part of the mythology too, right? So if you had a screw tape back then, that means you actually saw screw and met <laughs> screw, mm. right? Cause there's no conduit to get the great tape. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Back then, it, mm. it's not available in stores. It's, there is no distributor, as Michelle was saying. He's making this himself. Mm. And so as the, the, the idea and the concept of the music goes out, so does the mythology of who Screw was. Because the idea of what Screw was was much larger than what the actual person was, right? The way that people revered him, right? That wasn't something that he strived for. That was just mm. what people gave him. And that's just how people um, looked at him. But... Mm. 
No, there's a there's a difference between being an artist, creating music, and then people going to this third party uh, platform to get that music or anything. Like if you make chairs for a living, there's a difference between selling your chairs at a furniture store and actually making a chair for somebody. People have to remember these early screw tapes and the earliest in, um, instances of screw are all personalized, mm -hmm. right? This is not screw making one tape and then just giving and making copies and copies of that cassette. Initially, these tapes were each designed for each individual, but certain mixtapes, the flow was so tight, the music put together so perfectly, the story was told so well that people wanted other people's tapes. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's where the idea of June 26 comes from because at the time, even today, this is still the most popular, the single most popular cassette. Right, it's a Bond's birthday party, and most people didn't even know that person knew it was his birthday, right? <laughs> it's it's or a holiday. Or, or it's new to holiday, people celebrate, right? right? Or it's it's a holiday, isn't it? And I mean, now, it's not just it's yeah, like, it's actually yeah, a it's, holiday. <laughs> it's an actual citywide celebrated yeah. holiday, right? Yeah. To this day, and that just speaks to the power, but also the connectivity, hmm. right? And the way that screw tapes were able to bring an entire city together, hmm. right? You know, because what started out as something very specific to a spe very specific region and a very specific group of people mm. ends up becoming embraced by people all over the world. Mm. Mm. Wow. Miriam, can you uh, set up the third and final clip that we're going to look at from All Screwed Up, Nick and Screw? Yes. Uh, just set it up for us. Yeah. And then we'll we'll watch right. the third. Clip. Um, so in this scene, um, Nikki kind of walks in on Screw creating one of the more infamous um, mixes for a diss record um, that he's putting together after a carjacking happens in uh, in one of the previous scenes. And um, she expresses like her feelings and what she thinks about he's doing and, and kind of brings to his attention his influence and his power over the, the current state of the city. Um, so yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna watch the third um, and final clip of the program from All School. Who that, man, who that talking die, man, you got something to say? I don't like this. What, what you talking about? This gangster music, screw. This north side, south side beef stuff is gone too far. Man, it's a freestyle. It's not like something they wrote and memorized. How am I gonna stop them if I don't know what they about to say? You're the DJ. You're the producer. It's your music, screw. You make the rules. Come on, Nick. You'll be here. You know the stuff they say be off the top of the dome. I'm not telling them what the rapper about. Plus, this all they got. And I'm not about to be the one to take that from him. You tripping. Oh, I'm tripping? But you the one who got the laws pulling you over. Man, forget that cop. He don't know nothing, so he can't do nothing. Screw. I don't feel safe anymore. You think I want to live like this? Worried about you all the damn time? Scared you gonna get caught up in some BS and if you even gonna make it home. We better than this. You better than this. And if you can't see that, then maybe you need to do this without me. Welcome back everybody. Um, so we're gonna start wrapping this up uh, shortly. This is a, a question that has come up on the chat a few times. And I think this is a question for, for everybody. Um, how long did it take to make a DJ screw tape? <laughs> a bunch of people asked that. Was it an all night affair? Like what, you know? Sometimes it was. So, I mean, especially when we were in on Greenstone, you know, sometimes, I mean, I mean, you, I've seen, uh, well, not seen, but heard where they just, it was an all night thing. 
you know, and it, every and it wasn't it wasn't a scripted type, you know, everybody was, they were off the dome. We, you know, it was whatever, whatever came to them, you know, that's what they rapped about. And sometimes that was kind of like a all night thing, <laughs> you know? So probably I would, I would say at least 12 hours, <laughs> wow. you know, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Fun. You want anything you would add to that or? Yeah. Yeah. Add? Cause there's a, there's a difference between the, the mixtape that, you know, like the earliest Inceptions, right? Which is <clears throat> like strictly a mixtape, right? Which is just music being mixed together, right? So that's a little bit easier to put together. When it comes to the freestyle sessions, that's where things can become extended. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, one you may have three or four people who are set up to rap on the mixtape and then one person catches on and just kind of take over the, t- the certain beat. Right. So then now we got to go into another song just to let other people come into into the flow. Um, But, yeah, no, these things were, you know, when it's just music, that's a little bit closer to the actual time of the mixtape. Right. But I think Michelle makes a good point. Like there's no like screw isn't sitting there with a list of songs that he wants to play. Right. It's more of a feel. Right. And that, that was the beauty of the screw tape. Right. Was that. This wasn't top 10 records, right? This wasn't what you would get from 97.9 or 102 or any of that type of stuff, right? right? These were songs that many people had never heard of, um, artists that people had never heard of, and they were really Screw's favorites, right? So many people in Houston would have never heard of Sibo, right? Had it not been for DJ Screw, simply because that was one of his favorite artists. Right. Um, you know, I, he made there was a, a record by a, a group from the West Coast uh, called Above the Law. They made a record called Black Superman. Um, most people wanted a dub that had Black Superman on it. Right. Because these songs that even if even if you knew these songs, they felt different on a screw tape. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a mood being created on these tapes. Right. There's a as today we would call it a vibe. Mm-hmm. that's being created on these mixtapes. So each mixtape, at the very least, um, the only forethought that goes into it might be the name of it, right? Mm-hmm. But everything else is just him feeling his way through it musically, mm-hmm. you know, and feeling like this is what I think, bo- what this what this boy is saying on this record is what boys need to hear right now. Mm-hmm. That kind of a thing, you know what I'm saying? So he's creating a soundscape for you, but he's also putting you in a frame of mind so when you go get a tape like Million Dollar Hands, right, then the theme around a lot of the songs is hustling, grinding, and getting money. That mm-hmm. kind of a thing, you know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, so this was something that, you know, Screw was just, he was just doing, like, in the moment. It was always in the moment. And these things wouldn't happen, wouldn't even start, like, Screw not even started making a tape till after 10 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. You know, Screw, Screw is, in, in terms of hours, Screw is a vampire. You know what I'm saying? Screw is up all night, sleeping all day. I, you know, I never talked to Screw before 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Never talked to Screw early in, in the morning. And if he was up early, he wasn't really, he wasn't necessarily DJing. He was getting supplies every now and then. I have to run him to Sam's to go get tapes. You know what I'm saying? Hey, run me, run me to Fiesta. I need to pay my light bill right quick. <laughs> You know, because that's how that's how humble Screw was. Screw was the most important person in the city. And it took people years to get Screw to buy a car. <laughs> it took it took years to get him to indulge himself and indulge in the fruits of his labor. You know what I'm saying? But none of that stuff was mm. really important to him. He didn't put a high value on flashing and having things mm-hmm. represent him. Screw didn't. Like, Screw never wanted jewelry. Like, you know what I'm saying? Nobody elevated the lifestyle, the identity of peace and chain more than a DJ Screw. Diamonds up against the wood, DJ Screw. You know what I'm saying? But that wasn't him. He was just celebrating the, the South Side. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Did you want to add something, Isaac? Oh, no, I'm just laughing at Bun because that's like, Nikki told me the same as X. Yeah. <laughs> She was like, man, I wanted some jewelry and I had to drag screw to the, to the, to the, to the jewelry store. And that's how he ended up getting a chain. Like Kiki told me he was like, 
Man, when we seen Screw pull up in an Impala, <laughs> Wuss was like, Screw, uh, Screw got a car? Then he went and painted it? I didn't even know Screw could drive. I didn't even... <laughs> then you threw choppers on it? Oh, you couldn't know, Screw. <laughs> That was a big. That was a big deal. That blue Impala was a big deal because I think not. You know, first of all, it's, it's it was the, it was the car at the time, right? To have that that new version of Impala SS. But then also like Screw kind of allowing himself to enjoy his enjoy. newfound status and place in life, you know, because he was so music, 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 music. There was mm-hmm. nothing else for him. It was just. Mm-hmm. Music, 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 music. And then to see him in a car, like I would always see him at BAMS. That's why I was, whenever I would see the, the Impala, it would be at BAMS. And just the idea of Screw that, you know, DJ Screw is on the South Side in the Candy Blue Impala on Chops, you know, strictly from, strictly from mixtapes. And it's probably the safest place, you know, wherever that car is in Houston at that time, it's the safest place in Houston. Because mm. ain't You're no right. touch of screw. Ain't no touch of screw. Mm. That's not even an afterthought. He's too precious. He means too much. Mm. You know. Mm. Like I, re- I remember, I remember um, one night screw had got fucked up. Screw was out, fucked up, and he was tired and too, too sleepy to drive home. So he parked at Bams and slept in the car at Bam. <laughs> now, if any of us, any of us try to sleep in a car off of Griggs and MLK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ain't making it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> somebody, somebody gonna tap on that window and pull you up out of that thing. But that's just the level of love that people have for Screw. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Mm. Isaac, did you want to add something? Ask, you had a question from Michelle, I think. I was just saying, Michelle had told me a story. I think she was with Screw when he got the car. You remember you told, when he got oh. the car painted? He was like, "Chill, I ain't never seen that much money in my life." <laughs> <laughs> I had never. So when he when he decided to go ahead on and and and, and just bang out the Impala, get it painted, and he kept telling me, he said, "I'm gonna need you to go with me." And I'm like, "I don't want to go." So look at music and do all of that and painting all of that. He's no, I need you to go. And so we went, and he was like, "Okay." The man told him how much it was gonna cost, and and I had number one, I had never seen that much money let alone count out over $20,000 cash money to get this car done. Mm. And then he was so meticulous with it because he would count and he was a, he slow counted. <laughs> and so when he counted, then he gave it to me. And so I'm, you know, and I'm ready. And he's like, you know, just that slow count. <laughs> like, I'm going to make sure that this is right. You know, and then it's like, okay, and then he'll hand it to me, and I'm like, <laughs> like, okay, come on, brother. How about I just count it, and and then we'll go from there. But it, it wasn't that a way. He needed to count it first. Then I needed to count it. And then when he got ready to give it to the man, it was like he needed to count it a third time to make sure that it was the right amount of money. He wasn't giving no extra, and he wasn't giving no less. But to sit there and watch him count over $20,000, and, and, and I felt like it was like my sister had to go with me to help me do this. It was like nobody else could go do it but me. Mm. And it was like, okay, we're going to do this, you know. But it was just, and, and, I, and I'm like, bun, I was, I was proud of him when he got a car. I'm like, yes, you know. And then, you know, I was proud of him when he started doing stuff. And it's like, yes, look at my brother, you know. He, mm. he not the plane screw anymore, you know. Granted, he didn't want that status, but at the same time, I felt like he deserved that, you know? Mm. And so it was just, it was really funny to, to sit there and count over, you know, over $20 and, and to watch him count it. And, and I, as I tell Chill the story all the time, I just laugh about that because it was so hilarious because I tell anybody, that brother of mine never did anything in fast mode. It was always slow, no matter what it was. He didn't rush. He did, it was always slow, no matter what. And I guess I can appreciate that from him because, you know, you tend to rush and you forget things or things don't get done right or, or whatever. Yeah. But when you take your time and you, you know, as they say, when you on CP time, 
mm-hmm. everything is all right, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Michelle. That that paints quite a picture. Um, and yeah, I mean, back to what you were saying before, Bonnie, it is it is a vibe and it is a mood and it's it's incredible. And I just want to share with everybody in the audience and on the chat, we're sharing a link on the chat to um, a set that DJ Red did. We filmed him at the Screwed Up Record Shops and shop and we released that Friday and we're re-releasing it now um, in honor of the 20th anniversary of TJ Screw's untimely passing. So that should be, the link is in the chat. It's available now. It's incredible. Um, it's also just an incredible tribute to DJ Screw and to Houston rap and hip hop and music. Um, and that'll be available until midnight and it's free. So please, you know, check out the, the chat. There's a link there and um, enjoy. So I think we're gonna, this has been incredible by the way, everybody. And thank you so much for all of your, um, the just the pictures you've been painting and what you've been sharing and um i just want to i guess you know in closing i just want to ask like each of you are there especially thinking 2020 right 2020 the year of the pandemic the year of racial reckoning all the protests um biggest one in houston which bun was one of the leaders of which you know we are so proud of um you know Keeping that in mind, 2020, I'd, let's just go back to Screw's legacy, especially for now, for our time, for this, this, this year, what we've all been going through. Let's close out, just any, share any parting thoughts on, on Screw's legacy in 2020. I think, I think uh, what Michelle said just resonates with what is so synonymous with 2020, right? I think we move so fast in life where we Mm. Um, forget to sometimes take our time on the things that are most important. Mm. I think 2020 made all of us as individuals really be screwed up, literally. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, to a point where you didn't have no choice. Slow down. Go sit down. Take your time. Ain't no rushing. Um, And I think, you know, screw was a type of individual um, like we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, beyond just a musical icon, I think he was just a, a great figure to look at, like, if I could be reflective of Screw and be transparent and be humble and move, be, my mom always say, be be uh, slow to speak and quick to listen. Yeah. Um, and when you just think about Screw, everything, you know, that he represents, and just, uh, I just think that's so synonymous to 2020. And to parallel that with, you know, celebrating 20 years in 2020, um, man, it's an incredible thing. And uh, I'm just so excited for the family. I'm excited for the, for the friends of Screw. Um, and I'm excited for the fans. Um, there's so many people that have grown up on this culture. And, you know, like I said, at the beginning, don't even know necessarily where they got it from. It's so embedded in the culture now. You know, you hear stuff slowed and, chopped up and you know some of the most popular hip-hop songs and you really don't even understand you see beyonce on her netflix special slowing it down and doing the south side and you don't even it's, it's so embedded in our culture um that you know it needs to be um treasured it needs to be highlighted it needs to be beloved and so uh yeah i'm just excited man to share this moment with the family uh and you know, share this share this tribute with with, with the world. And yeah, man, I'm I'm excited and you know, just rest in power to be that group. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Isaac. Michelle, Bun, Miriam, any any last thoughts? You know, I I said the same way as Chill. You know, I I just <clears throat> I appreciate him. I appreciate the culture. I appreciate everyone that that is still repping for Screw. I, I appreciate all the love and, and all the support that we get um, as showing love to us to continue on with this legacy. I The shop is, is still going and I commend Bub for that because 20 years later, we still have a screwed up records and tapes and you know that hadn't stopped. And so, and in the new things that we're doing and, and coming out with and and it's all in honor of him, you know, everything that I do and, and I, I'm sure everything that everybody else does for him is for him. 
you truly do it for screw and I truly do it for my brother, you know? So mm. that's, you know, that is just that that's something that I will continue on until I just can't anymore. And, and I'm, you know, I'm hoping my children will continue that legacy once I can't continue the legacy. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Michelle. Mm-hmm. Bon, Miriam. Yeah. Um, oh, no, you please go ahead. Miriam. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think, um, I think we said this at the beginning. Um, it really is about, you know, like love, to be honest, like we, we did this because, you know, Chill had a vision and he did it from a place, you know, of adoration for, for, for Screw. And he really did it from a place of love. And then he brought on a team that, you know, we continue to facilitate the vision because of, of love. And, and I think that's really what, why Screw did what he did, you know? And if we could do anything to propel his legacy on and forward so that other people could, could know and be influenced by his work and his art, um, I'm just glad that I had an opportunity to be a part to help Welcome tell that to story. The so, and I appreciate y'all for letting me speak <laughs> this really is a full circle mm. moment for me you know mm. i went Thank to you, uh, a cinema arts festival in 2006 yeah <laughs> and i saw a panel and i was like man i want to do this and now you know <laughs> oh nice i'm here so i really do appreciate this and here you are <laughs> there's a pandemic we had to do it a little differently but we're doing it we're, we're building community however we can because that's what we do for sure um bun any any parting thoughts Bumby. I think he's muted. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Muted. No worries. Uh, I, I just wanted to say to Miriam, you know, that's as, as a board member for the Houston Cinema Arts Society, that's that's what we that's what this festival is all about. It's about introducing people not only to <clears throat> great films, but to a community of people that share their love for cinema and film and encouraging them to be a part of that world. So I'm glad that that resonated with you. Um, in terms of Screw, I, I defer to Chill on this one, man. The screw is the tortoise that beat the hair, you know, <laughs> in, 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 in a world where yeah. even in modern times where we see everything is about instant gratification and me, 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 and now, 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 you know, Screw was the person that showed you if you stayed, if, if you took the road that's slow but steady, if you stayed focused, you stayed determined, and you did the work, you could see the results. You know, so I think we can all learn a lesson um, looking at Screw, his life and his legacy as a way of recognizing that everything doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Right. And everything doesn't necessarily happen at the speed in which you might want it to happen. But if you stay dedicated to your craft, if you stay focused on your dream and you keep your eyes on the prize, you stay slow and steady, you stay humble and you stay prayed up then what's due for you is coming and will eventually come. It's just a matter of turning that corner. The beauty of Screw is that we all got to watch him turn that corner in real time. Mm. Like we watched, we watched the introduction of Screw, we watched the evolution of Screw, and then we watched Screw basically screw up the world. Mm. And we were watching it all in real time. I remember the first time I went to New York and played a Screw tape mm. for people. And mm. it was actually, it wasn't even a rap Screw tape. It was an R&B screw tape and and so they were playing like i think it was total i think it was a total song on the screw tape i think it's the one with biggie on it and my new york people was like yo this is this is kind of fly it don't even sound like them it sound like some dudes singing this song you know it was very funny how people you know and and the beauty of screw i will, let me say this before we close the beauty of Screw, when we when we talk about Screw doing what no one else had done, every time I go to a place like New York, when I have all the love and the respect for New York City, its beauty, its culture, and its people, but New York kind of feels like, you ever try to say, oh, yo, we did this to a New York, a New York would be like, oh, man, we did that mad long ago. We did that years ago, right? There's nothing you can say that you've done that a New Yorker isn't going to tell you they did way before. Not only have we done it, 
we over that. We don't even do that no more. Screw was the one thing that you could present to someone from New York yeah. and they could not say they did that first. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? So well, we were able to brag on Screw, right? And, yeah. and the, the beauty of Screw is that he's a DJ in every sense of the word. So everything that you traditionally expect from a DJ, Screw is that, right? So Screw isn't doing anything um, that, say, the clues and the Tony touches and the clay slays and all these people. He's not doing anything in terms of mixing and scratching. Like he can do that at the best of his ability as good as anyone in the world, right? And what the screw, what the screw tape does is basically pull the attention away from the DJ because most DJs talk incessantly over their mixtapes, right? Constantly bigging themselves up, reminding you of who they are. Screw's tape is the opposite of that. Screw's mixtapes used to take the attention away from the DJ mm. and give it to the person rapping. Mm. But the DJ eventually still got the credit, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to fight for that notoriety. You don't have to fight to be famous. If you're doing the right thing and people appreciate what you do, they will give that to you. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to fight for it. It will be bestowed upon you. So everybody just play like Screw. Keep take it slow, keep it steady, stay prayed up, but stay focused. Yeah. No, thank you, Bun. Um, so well said, all of you. And thank you, all of you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Bun, for everything you're doing for DJ Screw's legacy and Houston's legacy and hip hop's legacy mm -hmm. and black culture's legacy. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and rest in power, DJ Screw. Thank you, DJ Screw, for everything you did. Absolutely. Um, rest in power, DJ Screw. And um, good night, everybody. Good night, audience. Thank you for joining us. Good Thank night. you all. Screw Zoo. So screw Zoo. Good night, Joe. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Okay. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everything. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. All right.